So how do you do this, Matt? Yeah, that's good there. Thank you. Well, we're thinking about sanctification, and we're thinking about the Christian life and living the truth. We're thinking about putting the truth into action in our lives. And in the time that I have to be together with you, we're focusing upon one particular passage, which is in Hebrews chapter 12, and so I want to invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. And this afternoon, I want us to look at verses 2 through 4. I want to begin by reading this particular text. I want to start in verse 1, which we looked at last time. And as you recall, this entire metaphor that the writer of Hebrews is using is comparing the Christian life to a race. We're not racing against one another. And we're not racing against our own expectations. We're running the race that God has set before us. And the fact is, I run my race better when you run your race better. Because as you are excelling in the race that God has set before you, it encourages me to pick up my pace and to push ahead. And those who run by themselves and who are not a part of a, of a local church the way they ought to be, they often find themselves really lagging behind. And the reason is they're not running in a pack. They're not running with other runners. And we all need to be surrounded on this track by other brothers and sisters in Christ who have the same commitment and the same focus that we have. And we run the Christian life the best in the midst of the fellowship of other brothers and sisters in Christ. And we noted that as we run this race, it's in the midst of an enormous stadium in which those in Old Testament times and the first 20 centuries are already in the grandstands. And they've gone before us. And they have run their race and run it well. And as we read of the example of their lives in the Old Testament and in church history, we are elevated to a higher level of motivation and inspiration as we run our race. And it's so important that we not be, ha that we not be caring, as we said, excess baggage but we shed those things aside. I can't tell you what that is in your life. That would be legalism. I can only look at my own life and know what needs to be laid aside so that I can run unencumbered. And then the sin of not trusting God. We're all susceptible to this at different times in critical junctures of our Christian life. So the writer of Hebrews is painting this, this picture for us of the Christian life. And the reason that he is doing so is the book of Hebrews is, is really a sermon. At the end of this book, it's referred to as a word of exhortation. And I think the entire book of Hebrews is in reality one sermon. And it is addressed to believers who have left Judaism and who have left their dead, uh, their, their dead religion of apostate Judaism. And they have come to faith in Jesus Christ. And they've paid an enormous price to make this commitment. Uh, they've been desynagogued. They've been put out of their circle of religious fellowship. They've been put out of their families. Many of their parents have, have actually had a funeral service for their son or daughter when they commit their life to Christ. Uh, they're ostracized by their friends. They're put out of circles of, of business, and they find themselves in a very isolated place. 
And so because of this, they are slowing down. They are growing weak. They are beginning to faint because of the great difficulty it is for them as they now live their Christian life. All their problems have not gone away. They now have a new set of problems. In fact, there are great challenges for them as they are living their Christian life as first century Jewish Christians in the midst of of a world of of dead religion. I, I think that we can relate to that. We can relate to what it is to so many family members and so many friends who are just caught up in in dead religion in their churches, if they even go to church at all. And as we look around, at times we feel very isolated, very alone, whether it's at school or whether it's at work. And we need this encouragement as well, to not grow weary, but to press on to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We cannot remain where we are. We have to be moving forward by faith. And so having said that, I want you to look with me, if you will, as, I want, as in Hebrews chapter 12, I want to begin reading in verse 1. Therefore, and we noted last night how important that word therefore is, because That is the bridge from Hebrews 11 to Hebrews 12, and everything that he has said is now being pulled forward into this immediate statement. Since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance, the race that is set before us. Now here's our focus for this afternoon. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider Him who has endured such hostility by sinners against Himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. As we look at these verses this afternoon, we have three verses, verses 2, 3, and 4. And I have one heading that sits on top of each of these three verses. And I want you to see where we're headed, where the writer of Hebrews is headed. I want you to note in verse 2, the concentration. He says, fixing your eyes on Jesus, the concentration. And then in verse 3, the calculation. He says, for consider Him. And then in verse 4, the comparison, as he will say to them, you've not yet resisted to the point where he was in shedding blood. So let's look now at, at these verses and see what a help they are to us, to our Christian life today. What the writer of Hebrews said to his original writers, he says to each and every one of us, here this afternoon. So note first in verse 2 the, the concentration. You see, when you're an athlete, where you set your eyes is critically important. As you run and as you run the race, where your eyes are fixed and focused will have a large influence upon how well you run the race or how ineffective you are. And as you live your Christian life, where your eye is focused is of utmost importance. That's why we're calling this the concentration. 
He begins by saying, fixing, fixing our eyes on Jesus. We are to have 20-20 vision on the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to be riveted and focused upon the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to be gazing upon Christ. This verb is in the present tense. It means every moment of every day, in one way or another, we are to be fixing our gaze upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, we cannot see Him with our physical eyes. The reference here is to our spiritual eyes, with the eyes of faith, that we be looking to the Lord Jesus Christ within our heart, within our mind, and within our soul, that we're consciously aware of Him continually throughout the day, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, not just on Sunday morning, not just during Bible study, but throughout the day, throughout the night, we are to be fixing our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. I know that when I first began to preach, there would be times when my parents would come to hear me preach, and they would sit right here on the front row. And I would be so consciously aware that they were there. Not in a negative way, because they came to all my football games. They came to all my basketball games. They came to all my baseball games. They came to all my track meets. I loved having them in the stands. In fact, it it, it elevated my own motivation. But even as I would be preaching, there would be times I would look down and My mom is taking down notes and writing little remarks on correcting my grammar. (laughs) And I'd look at my dad, and there'd just be tears coming down his cheek. And I'd have to look away, because it would almost be distracting to me. But no matter where I was looking, no matter into what set of eyes I was looking, I was consciously aware that dad is right here on the front pew and that mom is right here on the front pew. And it's in a sense like that we are to be fixing our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, We may be talking to someone else. Uh, We may be driving to work. Uh, We may be tucking the kids in or bathing the kids. But we are consciously aware, no matter where we're looking and no matter what we're doing, our reference point is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are constantly looking to the Lord Jesus. Now, this, this verb, and it's really a, a, a participle, fixing our eyes on Jesus. It, it's, a, it's a compound word. And it actually means this. Looking away to Jesus. Looking away from something and looking to something. There's actually here a negative denial and a positive assertion. We can't look to Jesus while we're looking to other things. We must look away from the distractions of the world. We must look away in the sense of not of the world not capturing our our affections and our desires. I mean, 1 John 2 says, do not love the world. I've translated that out of the original language. Here's how it reads. Do not love the world. (laughs) Nor the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is passing away. That's that's like being focused on the Titanic as it's going down. We are to be looking away to the Lord Jesus Christ. Please note it doesn't say to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit acts almost as the lens that helps bring into focus our looking to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is pointing us to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And even God the Father is saying, this is my beloved Son, listen to Him. We're to be looking to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Christian life is Christ. What a simplistic statement that is. The Christian life is Christ. The sum and the substance of the Christian life is Christ. The Alpha and the Omega of the Christian life is is Christ. The Christian life is believing in Christ, trusting Christ, following Christ, loving Christ, worshiping Christ, serving Christ, adoring Christ. The entire Christian life is Christ. The Apostle Paul said, in Philippians 1, 21, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. The reason he can say to die is gain is because we go immediately into the presence of Christ. We graduate to glory. If you live for anything or anyone else, for you to die is loss, tragic loss. The only way for you when you die for it to be gain is if you have lived your life for Jesus Christ. It says, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Colossians 3 verse 2 says, set your mind on things above and not on things of the earth. Have you ever heard this expression? Why, he's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. I've never met that person. You'll never be any earthly good until you're heavenly minded. The more heavenly minded you are, the more earthly good you will be. We are to be constantly, continually fixing our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. And specifically, three things about Jesus. As we see it in verse 2, it's, it, it's just right there in the text. Number one, he is the author of faith. Now, all saving faith is in Christ. All saving faith is from Christ. The faith that we exercise in the Lord Jesus Christ at the moment of conversion when we entered through the narrow gate is a faith that He previously has given to us because we had no faith. Dead men have no faith. I remember the day in class when the professor asked the question, what can a dead man do? Referring to Ephesians 2 verse 1, we were dead in trespasses and sin. And I remember a student in the back row yelling out, stink. That's all a dead man can do. Dead men don't believe. Dead men don't repent. Dead men don't come to Christ. Therefore, Jesus must grant saving faith to the unbeliever, to you and to me, when we were in unbelief. A faith by which we then were liberated by the Spirit of God to exercise in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's just take a quick tour through the New Testament. Come to Acts 3 and verse 16. Just keep your finger in Hebrews chapter 12, but let's just go to some verses. In Acts chapter 3 and verse 16, Peter, as he's preaching after healing the lame man and this crowd gathers around, Peter takes full advantage of this opportunity uh, to preach the gospel And in Acts 3, verse 16, he talks about saving faith. And in Acts 3 and verse 16, we read, On the basis of faith in His name. All true saving faith is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And literally, it is a faith that is not just in Christ, it is into Christ. Christ. Just like when I flew here, I stood at the gate at LAX airport, and when they called for my group to get onto the plane, 
I, I couldn't just be standing at the gate. I had to step into the plane. I, I couldn't have one foot back and one foot in. It was all or nothing. And that's exactly what faith into the Lord Jesus Christ is. But please note where this faith, from whence it has come, in verse 16, and on the basis of faith in His name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know, and the faith which comes through Him. You see, the faith that's in Him is a faith that has come through Him, really from the Father through the Son applied by the Holy Spirit. Uh, how grateful we should be for the mere fact that we're believers here this afternoon because it is God alone who has given us this faith. Now come to Ephesians chapter 2 just for a moment. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, a text with which you and I are very familiar, but let's look at it one more time more carefully. In Ephesians 2 and Verse 8, I've already quoted verse 1, you were dead in your trespasses and sin. That refers to the unbeliever, and an unbeliever has no capacity whatsoever to exercise faith when the gospel is preached to him. Uh, there has to be a divine intervention in order for there to be this faith. And so in verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. What is not of yourself? What is the gift of God? Well, any exegete, any grammarian will tell you it refers to the antecedent if it refers to anything in this verse. Normally, we look at this and automatically assume it refers to grace, and it does refer to grace. But if it refers to anything, it refers to faith. You see, the faith that we believe in Christ is a gift of God, and it is not of ourselves. You see, this is why Jesus is the author of faith. He is the creator of saving faith. Let me show you one more verse. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 in verse 1, and it's positioned in this second Peter in a seemingly obscure place. This would be easy to miss. But second Peter chapter 1, we read, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Now watch this to those who have received a faith of the same kind as yours. Where does this faith come from? This faith in Jesus Christ. Well, you receive it as a gift, a grace gift. And there's only one who can give you faith in Jesus Christ, and it is Jesus Christ Himself. Uh, let me just show you one more verse. I, I passed over it. Philippians 1, 29. Mere fact, I remembered it is an indication we need to look at it. So Philippians 1 and verse 29, excellent verse. I just want you to be aware of these diamonds. Philippians 1, verse 29, Paul says, For to you, and the you refers only to believers, it has been granted, and for something to be granted means it is given freely as a gift. It has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His namesake. You see, it has to be granted to us to believe in Jesus Christ. This is one reason we need to be fixing our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. If we're going to run the race, and if we're going to put our trust in God, we need to keep our eye on the one who has given us this faith, and who has pulled us into the race, and who enables us to trust Him 
as we run this race of faith. You've got to keep your eye on the one who has given you this faith. But not only is he the author of faith, come back to Hebrews 12. I want to hear you turn the pages now. Go ahead. Don't be flipping that iPad. Turn the pages. <laughs> you weenies, Carl. Yeah, down here. Don't trip, don't trip over your skirt, Carl, with that, that iPad down there. Real men use a real Bible, okay? <laughs> borrow, borrow your wife's Bible, okay? <laughs> <laughs> as long as there's this distance between us. <laughs> I'm an old quarterback. He's a linebacker. He comes headhunting for guys like me. <laughs> he gets stickers on his helmets for tackling guys like me. All right, Hebrews 12, verse 2. You've got time to find it now. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Why should we fix our eyes on Jesus? Well, number one, he's the author of faith. Why would you be looking anyplace else? Because you need faith to run this race. But second, not only because he's the author of faith, but second, he is the perfecter of faith. And please listen to this. All in whom he authors faith, he perfects that faith. No believer will ever become an unbeliever. Just write that down. The faith that fizzles before the finish had a flaw from the first. It was a bogus faith. It was a Judas faith. It was a counterfeit faith. If they have fallen away and now they're an unbeliever, they never had the real thing. Because all in whom Jesus is the author of faith, Jesus is the perfecter of faith, and I want to assure you, He does all things well. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them from my hand. For my Father who gave them to me is greater than all, and no one shall pluck them from His hand. I and the Father are one. So we need to keep our eyes on Jesus, because He's the author of faith. Because he's the perfecter of faith. He, he is the one who sustains faith. He is the one who undergirds faith. And he will never let your faith totally implode. Spurgeon said, Noah fell down many times in the ark, but he never once fell out of the ark. <laughs> and you and I may trip and fall as we run this race of faith. And there will be times when we'll be spitting out some cinders out of our mouth because we have gone down and a stumbling block has, has caused us to fall. But we never fall out of the race. We never fall out of the Lord Jesus Christ because He is holding on to us. That's why we have to keep our eyes on Jesus. He authored our faith. He perfects our faith. Third, he is the example of faith. And as we continue to look at, at verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, number one, the author, number two, perfecter of faith. Now, number three, the example. Who, for the joy set before him, you see, the Father had a race for him to run. The Father sent him into this world on a mission. And it was a very narrowly defined race that the Son had to run. And the, Father and the Son has come in submission to the Father, and he does whatever the Father tells him to do, and he says only the words that the Father has given to him, and he has come to seek and to save that which is lost, and he has come to go to a cross, and there be lifted up to die, and to bear the sins of his people upon the cross. That's the race that God gave him 
to run. And it was a tough race. It was a demanding race. None of us here in this room can even begin to comprehend the difficulty of the race that the Lord Father gave to the Son. And what was pulling him through? He was looking beyond the finish line. He was looking beyond the cross to the joy that was set before him. The joy of his resurrection. The joy of his ascension. The joy of his exaltation. The joy of his coronation. Uh, the joy of having his sheep around his throne. The joy of, that it would bring to the Father for him to complete the mission. He could not be focused upon the muck and the mire of the difficulty of this race that he was running. He was always keeping the joy on the other side of the finish line before him. You see, he was so heavenly minded, he was of enormous earthly good. And you and I need to be doing the exact same. He is the example for us. We, we live in a time in which we are so blind to heaven, so blind to eternal things, that we are so riveted upon this world. Jesus was looking beyond the finish line and drawing strength and drawing anticipated joy who for the joy set before him. Now, please note the parable, the parallel set before him in the middle of verse 2. The last three words of verse 1, they're exactly the same. The joy that was set before him is like a lane on a track right next to our lane that was set before us. There was a race set before him, and there is now a race set before you and me. And the greatest champion who ever lived was the Lord Jesus Christ, who was born under the law and kept the law perfectly and fulfilled the will of the Father and won the great victory at the cross, who for the joy set before Him, please note the next word, endured. We've already seen this word in verse 1. Let us run with endurance. And he'll say it again in verse 3 concerning the Lord Jesus Christ that, that he endured such hostility by sinners. There's never been anyone who ever ran in this world with greater perseverance and greater steadfastness and greater tenacity. He set his face like a flint towards Jerusalem. And when you read Mark's gospel, as he is going for the Passion Week, and he is marching from Jericho into Jerusalem, the disciples cannot even keep up with him. They're not, he, he's not dragging and shuffling his way to Jerusalem as he goes into the week in which he will lay down his life at the end of the week. He is like a, a racehorse who is sprinting to the finish with endurance because this is the will of God for his life who for the joy set before him endured the cross just like you and I must endure tribulation and persecution and opposition and, and difficulty in this world. What an example the Lord Jesus Christ is to us. 1 John 2, 6 says that we ought to walk as He walked. And extending the, the metaphor, we ought to run like He ran. Despising the shame. And what a shameful death it was. There was more, no more ghastly death ever invented by evil minds than the death of crucifixion. It was a torture chamber on a cross. It was the electric chair of the first century. It was the product of, of barbarians that had been perfected into an art form by the Romans in which a man would be 
put on that cross and would suffer so much that he would long to die, but death would elude him. There would be no relief from the pain and from the torture as he would hang upon that cross. And as you died, you were... You were considered despicable. You were considered the scum of the earth. You were considered the criminal. You were considered a terrorist. In fact, Jesus probably died on a cross that had been made for Barabbas, who was the Osama bin Laden of the first century. He was a known terrorist. And Jesus dying on that cross, oh, the the shame of it all, that the prince of life would bear such a curse for us upon the cross, but this race led somewhere, and it says at the end of verse 2, and He has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. There's an old football saying, Carl, no pain, no gain. No cross, no crown. No crucifixion, no coronation. And what an example the Lord Jesus Christ has set for us. As we run the race that God has set before us, we cannot take the path of least resistance. We must plow ahead in the face of whatever darkness and whatever opposition there would be. We need to be like Caleb at the age 90. He says, give me the biggest mountain with the biggest giants on that mountain. He he didn't retire, he refired. And so we must press on in this race just like our Savior did as He lived here upon this earth. Are you fixing your eyes on Jesus? Are you taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ? Are you setting your mind constantly and continually on things above and not on things of the world? If you and I become preoccupied with the other runners, with who's in the grandstands, with our past, with our own injuries, with our own hurts, if we become preoccupied with that, there is no way that we can glorify God. But if we will fix our eyes on Jesus... I promise you by the authority of the Word of God and the sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can run your race through the most difficult and darkest hour of your life, and you can run victoriously, and you can be a champion for the faith no matter how how demanding and how difficult the situation you will ever find yourself in because Jesus Christ is greater than whatever it is you're facing. That's the concentration. You've got to have that concentration, sir. Ma'am, you must lock in on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, second, we've seen the concentration, riveted, focused, tunnel vision, myoptic, blinders on. Second, I want you to see the calculation. Because he says you've got to do more than just fix your eyes on Jesus. As you fix your eyes on Jesus, you must consider Him. Now, notice what verse 3 says. For, and the word for now introduces the explanation for what He just said. So, it's tightly connected with with, with verse 2, what we just talked about, what we just looked at. Now, verse 3, for... Consider Him. Now, as he says, consider Him, that that almost sounds kind of casual. Uh, Why don't you just get around to thinking about Him? Just just consider Him a little bit. This word, consider, is another compound word, and the main root word comes into our English language as logarithms. Logizomai. With a prefix added to the front to intensify it. In other words, injecting steroids into the the main verb. And 
just like you would have to do some careful calculation in logarithms. How you would need to be very precise and study hard and, and do the math and come up with a bottom line conclusion with a, with a, with a, a steel trap mind where you are doing the numbers. You're not shaving and rounding it off. Precision, accuracy with the numbers like a CPA, like a mathematician. So you must consider the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you, we cannot have just vague thoughts, devotional thoughts, heartwarming thoughts. We've got to study Jesus. We've got to do the math. We've got to calculate. We've got to analyze. We must scrutinize the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we, we cannot have a shallow, superficial knowledge of Christ. If we're to consider Him, th this means we must know Him. This means we must spend time with Him. This means we must study Him in His Word. This means we must be intimately familiar with His eternality, His deity, His humanity, His hypostatic union, His place in the Trinity, His offices, prophet, priest, and king. We must understand his, his mission and His ministry. We must understand his, his death and His resurrection, His ascension, His present intercession at the right hand of God the Father. A superficial understanding of Jesus will not do for champion runners who want to run the race to win. You see, we draw strength from fixing our eyes on Jesus. We draw, we, we draw strength in our legs and our lungs are enlarged, spiritually speaking, as we look to the Lord Jesus Christ. As we are looking away from Jesus, we're running out of gas. We're, we're dying in a pile. The runners would say, you've got the bear on your back. You, you just can't keep going. But when you look to the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a supernatural transfer of divine power into our spiritual legs and into our lungs and into our arms where we are bounding forward by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. But only as we consider Him and are fixing our eyes on Him. He says, for consider him who has endured. Here's our word that keeps running through this passage. This is all about endurance. Hey, how easy is it to start a race? How hard is it to finish the race? Consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself. Do you realize that from the moment he came into this world as a baby, he was facing the hostility of sinners? That even in his birth, Herod gives the decree to slaughter every baby boy two years and younger, and Jesus' parents have to, have to leave the country and go to Egypt just to escape this, this massacre of, of babies that was occurring. And as soon as Jesus inaugurated his, his public ministry, as soon as he was baptized in the River Jordan, and as he came out of his wilderness testing of 40 days, he goes to Nazareth, he goes into the synagogue, he picks up the scroll, unravels it to what is for us, Isaiah 61 verse 1, and he reads it and says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to preach. He handed it back to them and said, Today this has been 
fulfilled in your ears. So how did they respond to that? They tried to throw him off a cliff. And throughout his ministry, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the scribes, the temple police tried to arrest him. He lived at the end of his ministry under a death threat. And then at the end, he underwent six trials, three Jewish trials, three Roman trials. Annas, Caiaphas, Pilate, Herod. And then when he's put before the crowd, they cry out, crucify him, crucify him. And the Lord Jesus Christ continued to push ahead within the will of God and run the race that was set before Him. He did not flinch. He did not waver. He did not buckle. He pressed on in the will of God and burst through the finish line like a champion when He said, it is finished. He says, consider Him. You need to study Him. My pastor friends here this afternoon, you need to note this perseverance. How easy it is to daydream about being in another church in another place and not persevering where you are in running the race that is set before you. How easy for lay people to, to, to fantasize in their mind about another job, another wife, another church, another whatever. And there is a time and a place to move to another job. But as we run this race of faith, we cannot be weak need. We must persevere in the will of God. William Carey, that great Baptist missionary who went to, to, to India for over 40 years, he never even saw a convert after seven years. I, I would have thought I'm out of the will of God for my life. He never had a sabbatical. He never went back to, to England. Forty-one long years, he buried himself in the will of God and saw very little fruit. You know what he said? I can plod. I can plod. I can press on. I can persevere. I can endure. That's the calculation. And what's the result at the end of verse 3? So that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Listen, we are so susceptible to losing heart. And as we look to the Lord Jesus and as we calculate and consider Him, we do not lose heart. Now finally, verse 4, the comparison. Please notice, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood and you're striving against sin. The shedding of blood is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Already earlier in the book of Hebrews, the writer has said, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. A reference to the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. A reference to the perfect sacrifice that Jesus would make as He poured out His rich red royal blood upon the altar of Calvary's cross and made the one and only atonement for our sins. And to put this in right perspective, here's what he is saying to these first century Christians, and this is what he is saying to us. No matter how difficult it may be for you in your Christian life right now, no matter what the challenges are, it's nothing compared to what Jesus faced. Nothing. And I don't say that indifferently, and I don't say that without pastoral compassion, but I'm just telling you the facts. They're not about to nail you to a cross right now. 
You're not about to bear the sins of the world. You're not being rejected by the Father. Jonathan Edwards, who wrote 70 resolutions when he was 18 and 19 years of age, there would be a moral compass for his life. One of those 70 resolutions that he would review once a week was to think often of the death of the martyrs because it put everything in right perspective. And you know what? Compared to the death of the martyrs, I've never had a bad day. Compared to the death of martyrs, you've never had a bad day. Compared to the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, the martyrs never had a bad day. And what he is saying in verse 4 is, you need a reality check. You need to compare your race with his race and compare your suffering with his suffering, and you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. That's a healthy perspective for us to have. It tells us several other things that we have to strive against sin. We have to mortify the flesh. We have to resist temptation. We have to flee temptation. We have to fight the devil. We have to put on the full armor of God. Put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. Gird our loins with truth. Shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of of peace. Take up the shield of faith and unsheath the sword of the Spirit. We have to strive against sin. But none of us in our dealings with sin, have ever had to die for the sins of all of God's people, like the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, this is a word of exhortation, that this is a a passionate sermon that the writer of Hebrews is is giving to us. And it's a little bit like a, a coach coming in behind a player and giving him a little bit of a hit on the back of the shoulder pads. Like, come on, son, let's get going. We're playing football. You're going to get hit. You're running the race that God has set before you. You're going to get hit. You're going to face difficulty. You're going to face challenges. But you cannot slow down. So as I finish, how are you going to fix your eyes on Jesus? And how are you going to consider Him? Let me just end with some points of application. Number one, be saturated with Scripture. The whole Bible is about Him. The Bible is a hymn book. It's all about Him, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's in Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He is the mighty creator of all that there is. And all the way to the end of Revelation, he says, Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. Be saturated with Scripture and you will be fixing your eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Second, study Christology. Study biblical doctrine. Study systematic theology. Think deeply about the Lord Jesus Christ in theological categories. Go buy Biblical Doctrine by John MacArthur. Go buy Burkhoff. Go buy a great systematic theology and master the categories of truth theologically about the Lord Jesus Christ. Deepen your well of your understanding who Jesus is. Don't settle for just a a superficial knowledge of Him. Third, pray for this kind of focus. Pray that God will keep your eyes fixed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Fourth, memorize key verses about Christ. Carry them around in your heart. Fifth, meditate upon Christ throughout the day. Bring these memory verses to the forefront of your mind. Six, be in fervent fellowship. Like produces like. When you're with other believers who are on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ, 
That fire is contagious and it ignites your heart. But if others are, are just lukewarm, that also splashes water on the flames of, of your heart. Be with others who are fired up for God. Number seven, think much about heaven. Think of the glories of heaven where Jesus is. See him in the book of Revelation. See him with a head of hair, white like wool. See him with his face like the sun. See his feet uh, as burnished bronze. See him with eyes of fire. See the real Jesus as he is now upon his throne in heaven. Not the meek Messiah, not the humble carpenter from Galilee as he once was. See him now in heaven as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Eighth, think much about his return. He is coming back at any moment. He says, behold, I am coming quickly. Not I will be coming. It's a present tense. I'm on the way right now. James 5 says the judge is right at the door. He is ready to open the door and burst onto the scene of human history. He may come before we even finish this meeting. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. The trumpet of God and the voice of the archangel and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. You, you need to be living in such a way that you are straining to hear that trumpet sound. You need to keep your heart clean and your teeth brushed and just be ready to go to glory. Number nine, come to the Lord's table. It is God's means by which we remember his death and keep it before us. Number 10, ponder the accomplishments of the cross. Understand propitiation, redemption, reconciliation, expiation. Understand what Jesus actually accomplished upon the cross. Number 11, remember his humiliation. No one ever started out so high and ended up so low as the Lord Jesus Christ. And no one was ever elevated from so low to be so high as the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, there is nothing beneath any one of us to do here upon this earth as Jesus has shown us what it is to be a servant. Number 12, witness for Christ. Talk about Jesus. Tell others about Jesus. And number 13, give your testimony, which is different than being a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. To give your testimony means you talk about what Jesus has done in your life and how you came to a saving knowledge of Christ. And last of all, remember what it was like when the Lord found you and when he first saved you and when your heart just burst aflame with love and excitement for the Lord Jesus Christ, how you could barely go to sleep at night, how you were drawn like a moth to the flame to whatever Bible study was going on, and you just wanted to know more and more about the Lord Jesus Christ, and you just couldn't keep it to yourself, and you just had to talk to whoever was around you concerning the riches of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what it was like when you were first saved. And ask God to reignite your heart and soul and you will be spiritually drawn to fix your eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Apathetic eyes don't fix on Jesus. Lukewarm eyes do not focus upon the Lord Jesus. It is those hearts that are bursting aflame with love and devotion for Jesus that fix their eyes on him. So how will it be with you? Will you be looking to the Lord Jesus today? Will you be fixing your eyes upon Him when you go back to where it is that you live and you serve the Lord? Do you want to go deeper with the Lord? Do you want to calculate and scrutinize and study Him more? And compare your sufferings with His. It's nothing compared to what He suffered upon Calvary's cross. As you would find yourself here this afternoon, if you have never believed upon Jesus Christ, I call you this very moment to believe upon Him. 
He entered this world to seek and to save that which is lost. If the Lord is making known to you that you are lost, I want you to know that he was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless and perfect life. He died a sin-bearing, substitutionary death upon Calvary's cross. He was buried. He rose again on the third day by all of the authority that was inherently his as the Son of God. He raised himself from the dead. And he came walking out of that tomb, a risen, living, victorious Savior. He has ascended to the right hand of God the Father. All authority in heaven and earth have been given unto him. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you have never called upon Christ, I urge you, I plead with you this very moment. Tomorrow is the devil's day. Today is God's day. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. And if you have never believed upon Christ, run to Christ. Flee to Christ this very moment. He loves to gather in lost sinners. He is the friend of sinners. He loves to gather them in and pour out His grace upon them. And He's come not for the well. He is a physician who's not come for those who are well. He's come for those who are sick. You need to tell him how sick you are. You need to tell him how sinful you are. He didn't die for good people. He died for bad people. Tell him how bad you are and how desperately you need his forgiveness and his righteousness and his grace. And he will freely give it to you if you will but repent of your sins and humble yourself and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ you must fix your eyes upon Jesus in order to enter into the kingdom. You must consider Jesus if you are to enter in through the narrow gate. And when Charles Haddon Spurgeon was saved, the text was, Look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. And Spurgeon heard that and he said, I can look. I can look to the Lord Jesus. And in that moment there was life in a look. And he looked by faith to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he was gloriously converted and saved. Look to Jesus. Look to the Lord Jesus Christ. Stop looking to yourself. Stop looking at the church. Stop looking at other so-called Christians. Look to Jesus, and he will save you, and he will save you forever. Let us pray. Father, we want to run this race in such a way that will bring honor and glory to you. I pray that you will light a fire under us, that you will move us out, and that we will run in such a way here in New Zealand and Australia and the Philippines, American Samoa, wherever it is we have come from, that we will be running more faithfully and with endurance than we have ever run in our spiritual lives. And Lord, here this afternoon, for any who are not in the race, for those who are just spectators, for those who are just in the stadium but they're not in the race, Lord, I pray this afternoon, now, this moment, that you would bring them to yourself. So, Father, we commit what has been said to you and pray that you will seal to our hearts the truth of this text in Hebrews 12. May the birds of the air not come and snatch it up. May it not fall upon shallow soil. May it not fall upon rocky soil. May it fall upon soil that has been tilled up, and may it bear fruit 30, 60, 100-fold. In Jesus' name, amen.